sort of mid, uh, medieval kind of back and forth um, manner of, of learning. Okay. All right. So, um, so why did we choose? Why did they choose philosophy, and why do we choose it? So, um, so when I went to um, when I went to graduate school, the first semester we had to take a bunch of philosophy classes, and I was like, seriously, I don't want to do philosophy. I just want to do theology. Um, and I, it took me about I don't know two or three weeks of like pouring through the stuff to just kind of understand, finally understand why it was because it began to sort of spill over into things I wanted to know theologically is that God speaks to us in a language using categories that, uh, human categories, right? So he speaks to us in human language. And so um, it's things we can understand and in categories that are accepted <laughs> to our mind, but they're not just these sort of simple concepts, right? And so... Um, Philosophy really helps you to understand theology better. Okay, um, so this first, um, you know, this first session, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about philosophy in sort of relationship to theology, and then we're going to set theology sort of aside for the rest of the semester, and we're just going to go through an entire uh, theology sort of crash course in theology. Okay, I mean in philosophy. Um, so we'll sort of talk about today how uh, philosophy can be at the service of theology, but I'm going to leave it to you from there on out to sort of uh, connect the dots. And we'll, we'll do it as examples, and we'll talk about But what I really want you to do is to begin to see, um, you know, as we'll talk about it a little bit, you take a philosophy course pretty much. If you take a philosophy course on the campus, you will not be taught St. Thomas Aquinas, okay? Even though he is the greatest philosopher that's ever lived. And... Um, I feel pretty comfortable in saying that, like not you know just from a, a philosophical standpoint. Um, or there's been, the chance you'd be taught St. Thomas in like a day and be taught it incorrectly and misunderstood. It. Yeah, there's that. There is that too. Um, but I, I mean, I know that you know Aristotle. You maybe run into Aristotle, um, but St. Thomas took everything that Aristotle that was good from Aristotle and built on it. Um, so, um, so we'll talk more about uh, that when we talk about my man crush on St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> um, all right, so... All right, so I want to open sort of with, with a quote, okay? Uh, just to get us thinking a little bit. So this is from... Uh, you all know who Peter Kreeft is? So Peter Kreeft is a philosopher at Boston College. Um, he writes very accessible philosophy books. Um, and uh, he has a book on, on the Lord of the Rings and, and uh, the philosophy of Tolkien among his... Fit probably has 50 books, um, all of which are very accessible, by the way, and very Catholic. Um, so here's what he says, and this, this is what I want to sort of unpack to begin with, and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll dive a little deeper. Philosophy is not confined to philosophers, thank God. Everyone has a philosophy. As Cicero famously said, you have no choice between having a philosophy and not having, a, having one, only between having a good one and having a bad one. And not to admit that you have a philosophy at all is to have a bad one. All right, so um, you know, going back to what Andrew asked me at the beginning, like, how would you describe yourself? Well, how would you describe your life philosophy? If somebody asked you, okay, what would you say? Okay, uh, I'm not going to actually make you answer that question. Um, That's like but, the semester, right? Yeah, but the, by the end of the by the end of the semester, the goal is for everyone in here to be able to answer that question and pretty much have the same answer because you'll have the mind of a Catholic, okay? All right, makes sense? That's not too ambitious? All right. Um, okay, so um, so this idea then that everyone has a philosophy, there's a flip side of that too, and another reason why we're studying this, right, is that we can uh, begin to see when we're talking to people what their philosophy is. All right? Why is that important? Why does it matter? Is it like a, like, you know, like a game that we just play, like guess, guess your philosophy? Or why would, that, why would that matter? Why would it matter if you can pick up other people's where their philosophy goes. Yes, Con. How they think is going to have affect how they act. And how yeah, they act. I mean, exactly, right? So how do you think is going to affect how you act? But the other thing is, when you talk to people, there, there's a whole bunch of assumptions they always have, okay? So philosophy is, is a body of knowledge based on first principles, right? And what you begin to understand is when you uncover someone's first principles, you see where they've gone astray, Okay. Um, and we'll talk about that a lot. We'll talk about sort of competing worldviews and why their philosophy is wrong and why it leads them where it does, okay? 
Um, and a philosophy is wrong when it doesn't fit with reality. Very simple, okay? Um, all right, so, so it helps us to begin to spot errors, right? Um, and then when we see the errors, we can sort of go to the roots, right? Because you can argue all day with someone about uh, abortion, right? But they're making a whole bunch of assumptions about what's in the womb, right? And until you go, towards their, go to their assumptions and knock those down, you're just going to be talking past each other, right? And so we'll do a lot of, um, in a very sort of uh, like medieval scholastic way of looking at other people's ar- arguments. And the way St. Thomas would do it is he could actually make their arguments better than they could. Okay, so if you read, a lot of times you'll see people quoting St. Thomas and they're like, oh, he said this, right? He said uh, that, that women are just misbegotten males is a, is a famous one. I don't like St. Thomas because he said that. Um, and what they've done is, yeah, he did say that, but he actually said it as a, uh, he said it as an objection to his argument, and then then trampled over. It. Okay, so one of the things that Saint Thomas always did was take the arguments, the, the opposing arguments. If you read something like either uh, one of his summas, like this, uh, the Summa Theologiae, he starts with a question, um, then he gives three objections to to the uh, to his answer, then he gives his answer. Then he, and usually from an argument from authority, then he gives an ex- explanation of the an answer, and then he dumps the, the objections. Okay, um, and that's the sort of the manner in which um, we should begin to be able to look at things. Right? Maybe not with that uh, level of clarity, but nevertheless, um, it's a good way to argue is to sort of understand someone else's argument before you, you begin to try to top it. Okay, um, so there'll be a lot of that too. All right. Um, all right, um, so let's just talk very briefly about, um, I'm kind of scared after you said the thing about the syllabus, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, take, a little, uh, I'll take a little jump out here just in case. All right, um, this is my only syllabus. <coughs> um, okay, so um, let's just talk a little bit about the topics um, and why we chose them. Uh, so normally in a, in a, like a sort of a, a module of philosophy, you would start logic. But we're we're going to skip that because we need to get really bogged down in that. And honestly, they're not necessarily a distinctly Christian logic. Okay, there's an Aristotelian logic, um, which is sort of, uh, in my opinion, sort of the best. Um, but there are other kinds of logic, other ways to learn logic. Um, I mean, it'll be sort of interspersed. But logic is the science of right thinking, and so um, we're just going to sort of skip that. Um, and we'll go to um, we'll start with the philosophy of nature next time we meet Um, so philosophy okay just in general right so philosophy goes from what I see observe and tries to raise it raise the higher things so it looks at simple things everything in reality and then tries to raise to the highest things okay and it tries to order them remember it's an organized body of knowledge okay Um, and so what's the first thing outside of ourselves that we look at nature right so naturally, you start there, okay? Um, and so we'll begin, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, as we sort of journey from from uh, from creature all the way to creator within the bounds of human reason, we'll start by looking at the creatures, right? And we'll, we'll notice one thing in particular, we'll notice that everything seems to be changing, all right? And from that, we'll, we'll just keep building a foundation, okay? Um, and that's the philosophy of nature. Yes, God? Are we going to talk about philosophies where they question whether you can even look uh, very briefly, uh, when we get when we talk a little bit about uh, epistemology, which is the, the science of how we understand and how we know. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, we will talk about, and we'll talk about it next time we meet more, is this idea of what's called idealism versus realism. Okay, a realist says reality is outside of me, and that's where that that is what's real. An idealist says the only thing that's real is what's either inside my head or some um, ideas in some other world. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about those two sort of competing worldviews. Um, and it's important because there are, like, think of the whole debate over transgenderism. It really centers on that one thing. Like, because the person says, I have this idea of myself, therefore reality ought to conform to my idea. Everyone else says, no, like, reality says, you know, objectively, biology says this, you need to conform your idea to reality, right? And so this conflict, you see how you can argue with someone all day long, but if they have that foundational assumption that my ideas are what makes thing, make things real, 
then you'll never you'll never sort of move. Okay. Um, so yeah, we won't spend a whole lot of time on it um, because one of the things that uh, Aristotelian and Thomistic uh, philosophy is it's very common common sense, right? It relies a lot on experience, um, and very often when you encounter someone um, who has some of these strange philosophies, you sort of as you begin to pick them apart, you find out that they're unlivable and that they don't jive with experience at all. Um, so yeah, they'll come up, but we won't spend a whole lot of time on them. Um, okay, so um, so from there, so from the philosophy of nature, then we'll just sort of, we'll back up, we'll sort of uh, take everything we learned and we'll sort of go over it again, uh, but this time we'll do it uh, in relationship to empirical science, okay? Um, and I guess providentially, um, I realized that that date jives with someone who's coming to campus the following Wednesday to talk about science of faith, which... Um, which should be good. I mean, the, the, you guys should get a full sort of um, complement of looking at science from, from both perspectives of, of faith and reason. Um, so we'll do that, and then uh, then we'll begin to uh, look at living things, okay? Because that's psych- psychology in philosophy is just the science of living things, okay? And obviously the highest uh, material living thing is human beings, so we'll talk about that, which will lead us to ethics and epistemology, how we know things, Um and then, uh, then we'll, we'll take a little break for fall break and for the awakenings retreat. Um, and then we will go to that, what is the highest form of philosophy, and that's metaphysics. Okay? So metaphysics um, is essentially, the, the word sort of gives away what it is. So it's, it's meta is after, so after physics. So it's the, it's the uh, study of all of being. Okay? Um, so physics just looks at um, certain aspects of being and tries to measure it, right? Metaphysics looks at it and tries to know it completely and understand it. Okay, um, and then from metaphysics, um, we'll move to what's called natural theology, and that is essentially what it sounds like. It's what we can know about God through human reason alone. All right, and within that discussion, we'll talk about proofs for the existence of God. Um, and then the following week, we will do the problem of evil. Uh, And there's some good application in that question, good application for all of what we'll have learned at that point, so that's why I sort of picked that as a topic. Um, And then we will go to social philosophy, which includes like philosophy of the family, ideas like that. And then we'll have political philosophy, which should lead us into next semester where you guys chose chose Catholicism and American life, okay? So we'll look at, not to get ahead of it, but we'll look at the founding of America, how it jives with uh, the Catholic understanding of, of social and political philosophy. Okay, and then at the end, um, in previous fall semesters, for whatever reason, we have lost a class. So I've got a TBD there, um, and if we get all these classes in, that's perfectly fine. We can uh, throw a vote out there. We can just pick a sort of a, um, a random topic that everybody wants for the last day. Okay. Um, so Keegan, that's the end of the syllabus. Okay, moving on. We're good, right? <laughs> Less than five minutes. All right. All right. <laughs> so, um, okay, so what's philosophy? All right, so the, the definition that I grabbed here is uh, the love of wisdom. It is the science. And we're going to be used to using the word science, okay? The word science simply do, it does mean what we call sciences, like biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, all that. But science in general is broader than that. Okay, so science, as I said earlier, is a um, organized body of knowledge that's built upon s- first principles related to whatever the, uh, the particular area is. Okay, and it's a science in which natural reason seeks to understand all things by a knowledge of their first causes. Okay, so why why is that important? Why is that last part about uh, knowledge of first causes? Okay, so when you go take a class, okay. And someone gives you a bunch of facts about the, whatever the, the subject is. Are you, are you satisfied? Why not? Because you want to know where they came from. All right, so, so yeah, you want to know where they came from. What else do you want to know? More applications. Yeah, so, yeah, their applications. So, so Father just encompassed in one word, why. Right? You want to know why. Why it is the way it is. You don't, you don't want to just know a bunch of random facts. You want, first of all, to be able to put them in ordering um, so that 
uh, you know where they fit, but you want to understand, right? And, and that's the key, okay? So, um, so philosophy helps us to understand why things are the way they are. Okay, and it, it does that by looking at causes, what, what causes it, right? We'll talk a lot about this next time we meet when we talk about um, what are called the four causes. But uh, the point is, is that it's the love of wisdom. What's wisdom? Let me tell you what wisdom is. Knowledge of first causes? <laughs> um, the, sort of. If, uh, how many of you are, are seeking wisdom? Please all raise your hand. All right, so we're all seeking all wisdom. Seeking. Um, okay, but we don't know what wisdom is? Or is don't be shy. Are you, like, are we talking about from a like, more secular or like a, a... I just want to know what wisdom is. Right? <laughs> uh, I'm lost. Like, somebody told me wisdom was good. I don't know what it is. Yes. Okay, so that would be part of it. Go, can you give me a definition without God in it, though? So that's, that's right. But can you give me a definition without God? In it? <coughs> the potential to use experience practically. Yeah, that would be a pretty good definition, but not quite. Yes. A good judgment. Your good judgment. Yeah. So a wise person makes good judgment. So that's, that's the action. What is the being? What is the thing itself? What is wisdom? You understand things as they are. So, uh, okay, you understand things as they are. So when you, uh, so the, um, why am I blanking on this? So the last seven days of Advent leading up to Christmas, we sing the, what is the, the only antiphons? Yeah. What's, what's the first one? Does anyone know? So I'll give you a hand. Just say something about wisdom. Wisdom from on high who orders, right? So wisdom is the habit of putting everything in its proper order. Okay? Does that make sense? So the wise person knows where everything that he encounters belongs. Yes, Tom? Does that mean wisdom is a virtue? Wisdom, uh, yeah, I use the word habit. Um, it, it's a habit, uh, Yes, I would say it is a. It, it would be. I think you would have this trouble distinguishing it between the natural virtue of prudence versus wisdom, where they are a little distinct. Um, but you could say it's it's because it does have a habitual nature. It's also so like the gift of yeah. wisdom that we get from the Holy Spirit. It's a habitual gift, right? Like, um, okay. So wisdom is ordering all things, putting everything in their proper order. Okay. All right. So um, so philosophy seeks to do that. To take all of creation, everything we encounter, and put it in its proper order. Okay? And the good philosopher is wise. Okay? Is wise. Because he loves wisdom. Okay? So that's why it's called philosophy, is because it's the love of wisdom. All right? So to be able to order all things. All right? Does that make sense? Okay, so it's important that we always sort of come back to that, right? And this is why... Um, I said earlier that St. Thomas was the best philosopher ever because of that, because he really loved wisdom, okay? because he also loved wisdom incarnate, um, which a lot of the other philosophers that you're going to encounter didn't. Right? We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Though. All right, so here's the natural question. All right, so if philosophy can take and order all things, put everything in, in its proper order, what else would I need? So here's what St. Thomas says, right? Notice this is an objection. All right? Furthermore, every science must be about being, for nothing can be known except... So one of the things, uh, for you guys who are sort of repeat offenders, you already know this, but um, normally I'll put quotes, uh, like I don't use slides the way people tend to, I don't use them as like notes or whatever, they're quotes that I want you to be able to see while I'm doing it, um, so that one, that you know I don't just make stuff up. Um, but, but two, so that... Um, so that you begin to learn how to read these things. So Nora, if I put a quote up here, I will help unpack it. All right, so that we can, uh, you know, because St. Thomas said the, the Summa was a beginner's <coughs> book. Did you guys know that? He said it was a beginner's book. He didn't like it when he died. Um, Poor guy. Yeah, we're going to get to that too, about how he didn't like it when he died. Um, but uh, the, the point is, is that, like, um, 
because we're sort of so um, bogged down by technical language, we sometimes can miss nuances of things. Um, and that's what I, sort of one of the gifts of being able to think and judge and act like a Catholic is be able to read these things and go, oh, okay, I understand what that means. Okay, so when I put the quotes up here, yeah, at first you're going to go, okay, that was really long, and I had no clue what he said. Um, and that's okay, because um, after two or three sessions, you'll go, oh, I sort of get that. And then by the end, you'll go, oh, I can, I can actually read that. All right, so here we go. Furthermore, every science must be about being, okay? For nothing can be known except what is true, and truth is convertible with being. Okay, so what is he saying about that, right? Every science must be about something that exists, right? So the body of knowledge must be about something that exists. For nothing can be known except what is true, and truth is convertible with being. Okay. But the philosophical science is treated of all being, including even God. Thus, a certain part of philosophy is referred to as what we call natural theology, or the divine science, as is clear from the philosopher. When you see the philosopher, he's talking about Aristotle in, book, in his book, Other Metaphysics. Therefore, it seems su superfluous to have any other discipline than the philosophical sciences. So what he's getting at here, you'll notice this is the very first question, the very first article of the Summa. He's like, well, why would anyone want to study theology? He's like, we have philosophy. What do we need theology for? All right? And that's a fair question. All right? How would you respond? Because there are a ton of people, right? Are there any theology courses taught on this campus? Not really. Yeah, there might be. There might be one or two, right? So, but, so if, if I were uh, an alien from another planet and I came here and looked at, the, looked at the list of courses, what would I conclude about theology? No, useless. useless, right? Totally useless. Okay? Um, which is a little strange, right? To think that way. Um, but this is how a lot of people think, right? Um, I guess, like, I don't know, maybe kind of, uh, like Ecclesiastes, like Vanity of Vanities, it's like, well, it'd be cool to know how the world works and stuff, but everyone's going to die, so what's the point? I think that's kind of... Yeah, like, I mean, there, there, way is, you could get there. there is a lot of that in that, right? They're like, okay, th that it seems so, like, otherworldly, why, why bother with it? So there's certainly a lot of the sort of the vanity of vanities in that. Um, is it, isn't this saying that theology is a subcategory of philosophy? So, like, in saying we should only study philosophy, doesn't that doesn't exclude theology? Well, so remember, this is one of his objections, right? So this is, um, so he's saying, why do we need? Okay, so let's make a distinction, and maybe it'll, it'll become clearer. So there is a distinction between natural theology and supernatural theology. So natural theology would be what I can reason about God, right? Because we can reason about God. Supernatural theology would take God's revelation, what God has revealed about himself, and try to seek to understand it. Okay, so theology, the sort of uh, like textbook definition is faith seeking understanding. Okay, so, so the question is really like, okay, well, we have natural theology, why do we need more? Okay, that's what he's really asking. There's certain things we can't know about God unless they're revealed. Yeah, does that matter, though? Yeah. <laughs> okay. He addresses that in the next question. I think. Yes, yeah, I mean, he, he, he doesn't, obviously it's an objection that he doesn't agree with it. But the point is, is that, um, that it, it's this sort of line of thinking where Aquinas is writing in the 13th century that is, um, he's actually uh, prophetic because this is enlightenment thinking. Okay, this is, you know, 500 years later, this is the way people think, all right? So, you remember when we talked before about errors, right? Errors always come in pairs. Why is that? Opposite extremes. Yeah, because one person makes a mistake over here, and then the other person comes along and goes, oh, no, 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 that's wrong, we get it overcorrected. And they swing back the other way and miss the mark, right? And so, the, the you know, this is why, like, they talk about, it's like the mean of two extremes, so it's in the middle. Um, so this idea of rationalism is what, this is what that's called is just this idea that human reason is enough we don't need uh, God to reveal anything um, and so you see how, how that line of thinking has sort of animated life for the past three or four hundred years and you see how it keeps narrowing down right so there, initially it was yeah we can the enlightenment initial thing was like well we can do this it's just reason alone, right? And then they're like, well, we have nothing sure, so let's just go to empirical science. 
And so how many people now think that uh, the only way you can be sure of something is by some experiment? Right? And, and you see how it ends up degrading reason. Okay? Um, and people lose the ability to think. Yes, Connor? And does this kind of lead to ideism in your thoughts that, well, if we don't need to have revelation, then maybe God didn't even give revelation? Yeah, so everyone know what deism is that Connor used? So deism is, de- de- is uh, the, the sort of view of God that he just sort of wound up the universe and just sat back and watched. Okay. Um, and you could see, well, if by human reason alone, maybe that makes sense, right? Because we don't know any of his attributes. We don't know... Um, we don't know who he is, right? Uh, we know he's all powerful because he made the world. We know, um, you know, we can know certain things about him, but we don't know him. Okay. Were you gonna say something, Casey? No. Okay. Um, like, yes. Okay. I guess it's like if, if, uh, so if I can reason that there's God, and then, then I'm, um, if I can surround God with my mind then that would make me God, which wouldn't make sense. So I must not be able to surround God with my mind, which means there's more to know. Yeah, I mean, I can have if someone has that clear of a thinking, yeah, that would lead to this sort of, this hunger for for something more, right? This, this looking for revelation. Um, but most of the, like, most of the time, uh, which we'll talk about just in a minute, uh, most of the time people don't think that way. Um, and we'll talk about why that is in just a second. So let's, let's back up just for a second. Okay. All right. So this idea uh, that um, that we can know God, uh, know there is a God, with human reason alone, is actually scriptural. Okay. So Saint Paul talks about this in Romans chapter one, uh, verses eighteen to twenty-one. For what can be known about God is evident to them, because God made it evident to them. Ever since the creation of the world, His visible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in what He has made. Okay, so he's calling the Gentiles to task because he's like, they too knew that God existed. Okay, um, because God wrote two books, and this is Saint Paul's argument: right? the Book of Creation, in which you can look at what God made and reason back to Him um, and know things about Him, versus the Book of Scripture, where He tells us about Him. Okay, all right, so. What happens then is, with rationalism, is there's this exaggerated sort of faith in reason. Okay? Reason can, can solve all things. What's the problem with that? You're lacking first principles. Okay, so, so there are certain first principles you're lacking, but there's another part that totally is getting ignored here. That, yes, JT? Because of original sin. Yes. Rational. Yeah, 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 so we're, we're all a little muddle-headed. Like, that's original sin, right? We're just all a little muddle-headed. Um, and so even if we you know, think really clearly, we're not thinking all that clearly. Okay? All right, so what I want to do is now squeeze this, okay? Squeeze this sort of juxtaposi- juxtaposition between uh, reason and faith. So what is faith? You're not allowed to use my definition. I mean, it's a basic thing, right? We should be able to define what faith is. Somebody take a crack. Believing without seeing. Okay. Believing what without seeing? That's an answer, that's, and you're right. Divine revelation. Okay, so believing divine revelation. Why? Why do you believe divine revelation? Because you reason that divine revelation is true. Okay, what do you guys think of that? I reason that divine revelation is true. Is that good? Is that okay? No. I mean, we're not yes, called to blind faith in, in revelation. We're called to faith. So, there's a... This is really... The reason why I want to tease this out is because this is really important. There's a, so there's a slight distinction, which is like the things we believe are reasonable, which means they don't contradict things that we know by reason, but we can't always get to them by reason. Okay. What were you guys thinking? Because you're trusting the authority that came to you. Yeah. So faith... Wow, I was really excited about that. Sorry. <laughs> I got a little echo here. Um, faith is in the fact that God has said it who can neither deceive nor be deceived. Okay? And no amount of reasoning can get me there. You know why? Because it's a gift. 
Supernatural faith is a supernatural act. It's a gift. Okay? That part is really important for us to remember. Okay? So when you're talking to someone about Revelation and they're just not getting it, guess what? They don't have the gift of faith. So you need to back up, go fast and sacrifice, and God will bestow the gift of light on them. Okay? Yes, Andy? But can you decide by reason whether it was God revealing us or some other force? Yes. You guys want you guys want me to answer that question more in depth or just say yes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, just it's a little bit of a, a, a sidetrack. Um, all right. So so we can all say okay. Well, if if God is up on this mountain and He speaks and everyone hears it and, and they ought to believe it, right? Because it's God. Okay. So that's makes sense. But the real question is, how do you know when it was God that had spoken? Okay. Now, if you guys remember, we did this a little bit last semester when we talked about what are called the motives of credibility. You guys remember talking about this? The motives of credibility. All right, so, so okay, I think God has spoken, so how do I know that it's actually him that spoke? Can you clarify by, by spoken, are you saying scripturally or like in... Either way. Okay. Either way. In it through the church. Yes, yeah, Charlie. One, all natural causes must be reasonably discounted, and two, it can't contradict any previous revelations or um, natural theology. Yeah, so that would be that would definitely be part of it, right? I think there's there's more to it than that. So, so what? How did you know that? How do we know that Christ was the Son of God? What did he do? Things that only God could do. Yeah. So, so the miraculous, but there's something else he did too that really important that we don't always grasp. Anyone. That any reasonable person should look at them and go, hmm. He claimed to yeah. be God. Well, he did claim to be God, and, and yes, he seemed to have been Prophecy. There were people 300 years before him predicting when he was coming, what he would do when he came. All right, that's a, like, if you just now step back and you go, okay, do I have any reason to believe this? Well, that's a pretty strong reason. 300 years before, right? 300 years before they were predicting that he was coming, and like, if you read the book of Daniel, they nailed it. Like, nailed it within less than a generation. Like, that's why everyone was, like, when Christ came, was sort of up in arms a bit. Like, there's messiahs everywhere. Um, all right, so Christ had motives of credibility, reasons to believe what he was saying was true. All right, so the miraculous and prophecies, okay? And what is every prophet in the Old Testament, what do they, what do they have with them when they... When they say, thus says the Lord, why don't people just go, dude, come on, seriously, we went through this yesterday, and we told you you just full of it. Miracles. Yeah, there's always company by miracles. Like, why did they believe Moses? Yeah, he did some pretty kind of cool stuff, right? Like, he was, those, those weren't just party tricks, right? Like, those are pretty remarkable, right? So, so always accompanied by miracles. So miracles are there to say, okay, like God, only God could do that. This dude says that he's working with God. I think it's reasonable to believe him. But that's full stop. I think it's reasonable to believe him. The gift of faith to actually believe still requires God to intervene. Okay. All right. So uh, yes, Connor. So prophecy probably can only be fully understood after it actually occurs because there's most of the time yes. Yeah, I mean, there, there's some clearer ones, but yeah. I mean, for the most part, like John Henry Newman has a whole section that he talks about prophecy, and he says usually, you know, 99.9 percent of the time they're, they're only understood after the fact. Um, but yeah, so um, so yeah, so when when someone's looking at Christ, and this, the reason why he said like he continues like Matthew continues to go, this was so that he could fulfill the prophecy. Like that's why he's doing that, right? Um, because it, you know it may not be clear at the time, um, but so so let's let's sort of flash forward a little bit then. So the motives of credibility. Well, why? Okay, so fine. Jesus was God. Like, why do we believe the church? Because the church claims to be His voice. Why would we believe the church? Same reasons. He gave her authority. Well, yeah, but but how do we know? How do we know that something wasn't? You know, they didn't pull the old switcheroo or something. What are the two? What are the two things? Miraculous. What's the miracle? Have you seen the people in the church? <laughs> go to church, right? The miracle is the church. Like Saint, this is what Saint Thomas says. He's like the miracle because somebody asked him. They're like, well, why don't we see the same miracles that we saw with the apostles? Right? Think again about the apostles. Right? 
Why were they so believable? Because they did stuff that no one else could. Yeah, and they had dynamism too, right? right? <laughs> yeah. um, no, they they were saying things and backing it up with things that only God could do, right? And and there's this proliferation of them, right? But at a certain point, that stops. And St. Thomas says the reason why that stops, why it's not happening as much, is because we have a miracle. It's called the church. Right? The Catholic church still existing 2,000 years later, starting from 12 men, um, going through some of the, I mean, you guys know, we've talked about the history of the church, right? So um, the fact that it still exists today is in and of itself a miracle. There's no other explanation for it. Okay. Um, and he even, he even gets a little cute, and he's like, well, even if it's not a miracle, it's still a miracle, because no human institution could still do that. Right? So that's the point. So it's no mere human institution, because no mere human institution could not. Um, so I, I see Casey looking up at the ceiling, which means he's really thinking hard, and he's going to throw Islam at me for uh, something that's lasted a really long time. I wasn't going to throw is, uh, Islam, but I was simply going to say, like, yeah. that seems like a... You're, you're using this as an example that is kind of like I don't know. It just seems odd because yeah. So if so, that was so true, then anyone outside the church would say, "Wow, this, there's no other reason." So it just doesn't seem so. Well, that's because we don't advertise it. Like honestly, that I mean, that has a lot to do with it. We don't talk about that fact, right? We don't talk about the fact that um, people think that what they've seen with all the scandals recently is horrible, and they have no idea how yeah. bad it's been. The before. other thing is that argument that one holds of like you start with. The idea that the Catholic Church was like directly founded and instituted by Christ, which I've surprisingly found out that it is actually somewhat common among certain Protestant groups to believe that the Catholic Church was founded by the Emperor Constantine as a branch of the Roman Empire. Yeah, so that's like a totally different discussion, but yeah. clearly untrue. So the, that the other the miracle of it, remember, always, it has to be with the start too, right? Because it takes these from these twelve men and spreads in a time of persecution. From twelve to whatever we have today, like what is it? The almost two more billion. Yeah, almost two billion, or almost one and a half billion. Right? That now is that proof? No, but some. If you really want to know the truth, like you have to take that very seriously as an argument, right? Yes, Steve. As far as Islam goes, I've heard that. Um, I still get a whole can of words. When God promised Abraham the the worldwide blessing and like the. Um, the many many generations, like even though he he took that and went like and, and it sinned with it with uh, with Hagar, like the the blessing still translated. So like Ishmael was going to end up having. Yeah, that's one of those. I think uh, I don't call it a misnomer. Uh, so what Saint Thomas says when he talks about Islam is he says, okay, here's a man who claimed to be a prophet. Okay, what are the signs of a prophet? We were talking about miracles. He's like, Muhammad had no miracles. He's like, okay, what about the miracle of Islam? How did it spread? Because Christianity spread miraculously, right? Not by the sword. So St. Thomas in, in the Sumer Contra Gentile says, for that reason says, that's a bad example. Um, because it, it spreads and endures by force, where the Catholic Church does not. And a, human, a, a mere human institution could always do that. Yes, Connor. I'm not sure if it's a, a perfect argument, but it also says that his descendants are going to be coming through uh, Isaac and not Ishmael. Yeah, I think that's one of those um, things that people like. That I think they're trying to be uh, ecumenical. Maybe it's a, the best word I, best word I could come up with to be kind about it. Um, but I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that if we know what's true, which is the Catholic Church, like we then have an obligation to tell people the truth. Like we shouldn't be sort of kowtowing and backing up like we should be trying to convert Muslims right like that's just the way it is yes so I've got a question are you making a distinction between human institution and religion saying that we as Catholics are different than say Jews who have been along, around way longer than we have in some other pagan religion that still exists even in really tiny numbers yeah so I think what, we're, what uh, yeah I would say that it, it is a the distinction for the motives of credibility is between a supernatural institution versus a human institution. Um, so, like, Judaism is a good example, right? Why did the Jews still exist, you know, why did they still exist after it seems to be that God was done with them, right? Because Scripture tells us, the reason is because Scripture tells us he's not done with them, right? And one of the reasons that we can, they, it becomes a motive of credibility, how do we know that the things with Moses actually happened? Because the people he founded are still 
together. And so we can, like, it all fits together with a, a mode of credibility. But the, the sort of the end game of that still is, as, as St. Paul says in Romans, like, even the Jews will be brought into the Catholic Church. Okay. So, so they, they endure uh, because, St. Paul says, because of their forefathers, um, but also because of God's promise. Um, but it doesn't somehow then mean that we don't, they don't need to be converted because the ultimate goal is for their conversion. Um, so yeah, I think that this to answer your question specifically, the distinction is meant to be between a merely human institution versus a supernatural institution. So it starts from the reality that the Catholic Church is an institution. Is it superhuman or is it just human? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So what about like maybe some of the Eastern religions like Hinduism and then how do we distinguish if it's a natural or a supernatural? Yeah, I would say so this is where you have to be like a little bit careful. So. I would say there's no institution of Hinduism, right? Like it is a cultural, um, th- yeah, it's a cultural phenomenon. Thank you. That's a that's a good word. Um, where uh, you know they don't there's no uh, there's no structure to it. There's no teaching authority. There's no, like it doesn't have any of the signs of a an organization. If that makes sense, which I think would would go to your sort of your question about the some of the pagan religions is the same thing, right? They're not. They don't necessarily have the organized structure that you would say, okay, that's that's some that's a society of some sort, right? It's it's more of a cultural, um, just a, a cultural. Uh, I don't call it idiosyncrasy, because for lack of a better word, idiosyncrasy, just something within a culture. So you're talking more of an institutional structure versus just a belief system. Yeah, in yeah. Okay, that's right. Yes, Kevin. This might begin a little too in depth, but just to see. So, with regarding miracles, um, there are certain examples where basically the devil can do miracles too. Like Moses, like Moses, right? The war. Yeah. John the Cross talks about the devil because he's smart enough, can't predict the future, but can knows enough about the cause that what's causality to be able to say X is going to happen and Y, and then Z. You guys know the fascination with magic. That's exactly what that is, right? Like magic comes is just angelic power that the devil gives people. Go ahead, sorry. Well, that, that's what, so how do you, I guess, go back, I, I, I think it was, I wanted to see, like, so how do you go about distinguishing between what is demonic and what is... Yeah, I think it, by the fruits, right? By, your, by the fruits you will know them. So, yeah, like, the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. Um, so, in our case, like, so uh, miracles, you know, are meant to be, to back something, right? Like, this is why the church spends so much time on Mary and apparitions, right? Trying to figure out what's really going on, right? But the first criteria they always use is, okay, uh, is this contrary to, to the deposit of faith? Or is this just, uh, well, I mean, it would be treated as prophecy, right? Like, when Mary appears, it's a prophecy, right? She's saying, okay, the gospel needs to be lived out in this way at this particular time. Um, and so the church is very careful, though, like, even when they have Mary and apparitions, they don't normally, like Fatima even, they don't tell you what they actually mean. So the, like, that's the whole sort of um, controversy around the three secrets, right? Where they won't tell you per se what they mean. They'll say, because the, the human beings who experience them can make errors. But they're not protected the way, like, like someone is a true prophet in scripture, right? So they, they can receive the message, but then make an error in conveying it or not tell it completely like it needs to be told. So like the children of Fatima, when they tell the message, they may have left something out, right? And, and the church just has to understand that, okay, well, as far as we can tell, this was authentic, and what they're saying jives with the gospel. So you should believe it. You, you have reason to believe it. Isn't one of the motives, at least from my, like one of the motives of uh, apparitions is the fact that I, I thought maybe it's Fatima or Lord's like the little kid who normally receives, especially Mary apparitions, is very consistent in their story, and so it's supposed to be like God is. Yeah, no, it's not a matter of like I'm not doubting that they've had. So remember, like when God gives you a message, right, infuses it directly in your intellect, right. So you need to now put it in human language in a way that can be understood, and no, I no amount of words can fit an idea completely, right. So I could leave out a, a really important part of it. So I have to use my own judgment. So they don't have; they're not inspired that they use perfect judgment as to what should be said and how it should be said. So it's not a matter of, like, the authenticity can definitely be there, but they can leave stuff out, or they can say it in a way that's confusing. 
or you know, I mean, again, using the third secret right, of the the image of the Pope going up the, the mountain and, and being killed. Like that's like if you read that, it's really confusing, right? And you can apply a whole bunch of stuff to it. Um, whereas probably the message given to them was probably really clear in their mind, but they were hampered in their ability to convey it. Does that make sense? All right. So going back here. Um, Wow, we really took a big circle. Um, <laughs> I don't even remember where I was. Uh, oh, okay. So, so, okay. So, we talked about what faith is. Everyone agrees that faith is, we all understand the difference between supernatural faith and natural faith, right? So, faith, just little f faith, is just to believe based on the authority of another person. Okay. Capital F faith is to believe on the authority that God has spoken. Right? And he says it, and he can't be wrong. So, and we see this all the time, right? You see arguments in physics, someone will, like, an argument from authority, right? They'll refer to Einstein or something, right? Um, but Einstein could make a mistake, right? God can't, all right? Um, so, so faith is, in essence, believing everything that God says. And then the gift is that you are able to adhere to it, okay? Um, all right, so it's, it's the ascent to those things which are unseen, all right, so that, that two parts of it, um, the two parts of um, that the certainty comes in the fact that it, who spoke it. All right, so faith isn't, sometimes people act like faith is, isn't certainty, but it is. Okay, because it's really God sharing his knowledge of himself with us. All right, that's the best definition of faith. All right, so, uh, okay, so, all right, so fine, now we've sort of gotten... Uh, sidetracked a little bit with faith. So, um, JT already sort of hinted at this when he talked about original sin. So, why does God have to reveal something like the Ten Commandments? If we can just reason to that. Yes? He doesn't have to. It's just, it helps us out. Yeah. So, because of original sin, thank you. I mean, to put it sort of simply, um, uh, let's get to this. It is for this reason that divine revelation must be considered morally necessary for those, so that those religious and moral truths which are not of their nature beyond the reach of human reason in their present condition of the human race may be known by all men, that should be men, readily, with a firm certainty, and with freedom from all error. Right, so this keeps us, right, he keeps us from making error, right? Because it's not, it's not entirely clear uh, to the average walking around person that, uh, that they have to follow the first commandment. That God is one. Now you could reason to that, and it takes a little bit to get there, right? But that's not immediately obvious to people. So He gives the first command. Okay. Um, all right. So that's that's the idea. Okay. So Revelation gives us both what is beyond reason and what is what we could reason to. All right. All right. So let's um, sort of uh, change tracks for just a second, and I want to. Uh, does anyone uh, not, after everything we've said, does anyone not like the title of the course, which is Christian Philosophy? Everyone give her that title? It's philosophy. Why do you need to have the Christian as an adjective? Okay. Keep talking, Charlie. <laughs> Christianity, specifically Catholicism, is the one true faith, and everything in contradiction to it is error. So therefore, if we do good philosophy, it therefore follows that it is Christian. Okay, everyone agree with what Shrevy said? Maybe? Yes? Just a great deal of that. Because could you have a philosophy that is good, but is lacking in those things that are needed to be revealed or not? So, so it doesn't say anything false. So could, so could you have, yes. say, Aristotle? Yes. Would that still be considered an interview good philosophy? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, like, Aristotle missed a few things, but remarkably, like, the heights of human reason, it's a good philosophy. So the reason why I'm asking whether we should maybe uh, think twice about the title is I said philosophy is a science, right? Do we have Christian mathematics, Christian physics? So what do you guys think of Christian philosophy? We don't have to have the Christian mathematics because all mathematics, unless it's like untrue, it still fits in like the category of Christian philosophy, whereas there are lots of philosophies that are that are wrong, but the world would see as right, and they would use different adjectives there instead of Christian. I kind of like the standing up for it, though, because if, if it's wrong math, then it's just not math. 
So okay. if, it's, if it's wrong philosophy, then it's just not philosophy. So I mean, you can you can put a label on it, but like by its nature, you're looking for what's true. And if Christianity is true, then you're searching for the same thing. So it's one of those like, eh. What are you saying? I would say that fundamentally you're right, but that it's a lot more obvious when you have when you've done bad math than when you've done bad philosophy to most people. Yeah. So it's an important distinction for clarity, I would say. What are you going to say, it's nice to know something really smaller because I imagine that. Preface is half the way. Where's the idea that. I'd be worried if you didn't say that, by the way. Yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, it basically applies to like religious pro as well. When did the idea that there isn't a true philosophy come on the scene and that like you can have, like, there's not a true religion? Oof. Uh, the, the Reformation. Right? So the, the Reformation ultimately. Uh, is not just a religious error, it's a philosophical one, too. Right? They, they adopt nominalism. Like, and we can talk more about that in a minute, but, uh, but at the heart of much of Luther's errors, there's philosophical errors. So, but you wouldn't say the same thing about the Great Schism or, or about Eastern uh, Orthodoxy? No, that's a purely, I would say, because for the most part, uh, again, by their fruits you will know them, right? So... Um, so you see, like in, in Protestant circles, you see this uh, move towards either rationalism or fideism. Right? They want to know what fideism is, basically. You can only know things by faith. That's all you can know about. And they vacillate back and forth. Um, so I think the reason to balk at Christian philosophy is the fact that philosophy is philosophy. Right? It's what human reason can do. Christian philosophy, though, is philosophy that has arisen within a Christian context. Okay, so philosophy is, is not just some abstract thing that just lives in a vacuum. Um, so the, the title Christian philosophy is meant to convey the fact that it's philosophy that fits with the Christian understanding of reality. It fits with and explains. Okay? Yes, kind of. Could it be expressed as philosophy that uh, with the benefit of revelation... Like philosophy, true philosophy with the benefit of revelation, because you could have a true philosophy that didn't have. Yeah, so ultimately that's that's where we were going. Okay, so what is then the relationship between philosophy and theology? Um, and the short answer is is that um, is that revelation is meant to purify philosophy. Okay, faith purifies human reason. All right, so if I'm off, uh, you know. And a line of thinking that I shouldn't be on, uh, revelation can bring me back. Okay. So faith can bring me back. So this is where we have to sort of understand that um, that faith is more certain than what I can reason to. Right? Even though it seems like people would say, well, it's just it's the exact opposite. Right? Faith is a source of knowledge, and it's more certain than anything I can possibly reason. Why? Because God revealed it, right? That really important take-home message, right? Is it's certain because God has revealed it. Um, all right, so then this idea then that uh, what makes St. Thomas the greatest philosopher, period, is the fact that his uh, philosophy was purified by faith. Right? So he began to see, he, now we're going to talk about wisdom again, he truly loved wisdom, but not just human wisdom. Okay, so philosophy only leads to human wisdom. Divine wisdom puts everything in order and it orders everything towards my final end, which is the beatific vision. Natural wisdom orders everything towards the knowledge of God as the first cause, which is the goal of philosophy. Theology or uh, wisdom the supernatural gift of wisdom orders all things towards my salvation. All right? Everyone sort of understand that. So the wise person who has the gift of wisdom sees everything that happens to him, everything in his life, sees it within the designs of providence and sees it as aiding him towards his salvation. That's true wisdom. Okay? To be able to look at whatever mess is going on, whatever is going on, to just stop and go, no, I, I see where this is going, right? Supernatural wisdom is uh, Joseph like, uh, in Egypt. What does he do? Yeah, he 
meets his brothers and they're like, we're so sorry, we're so sorry. And he's like, no problem. He's like, God had a plan. Right? That's supernatural wisdom. All right? He didn't poo-poo what they did. He forgave them, but he forgave them because God had a plan. All right? So that's supernatural wisdom. No human wisdom could have done that. Yes? Go ahead. Okay, so when we talk about like purifying philosophy, um, I guess kind of a, a truth seen in spiritual life, but as somebody falls deeper and deeper into sin, their thought becomes like more and more obscure and they just have a harder time seeing reason. And as somebody grows higher in sanctity, they can start to see things clearly. And kind of Thomas Aquinas is very holy, uh, was able to do that. Does that mean like, so let's take a society like we have around us where many people are going to be intentionally, you know, willingly or not, like, buried in a lot of sin, um, or I guess it'd be impossible, wasn't, but willingly buried in a lot of sin. Uh, do you almost fall into, like, kind of practical, uh, a practical, like, depravity of man, where they, it's impossible for them to see without light shining from the outside? Yeah, so that's why the antidote to, like, any time, like, civilization is falling apart, the antidote is always a saint. Right, because they inject because man still has the desire to understand like even the person in the worst uh, situation you know so far off of the, the, the path in sin still desires the light and saints bring the light and so that's what they do and so they, that's why you know for our society to turn around it's very simple a bunch of saints I mean we could wait around for a married apparition I guess but from our perspective, is just be a bunch of saints. Like that's like saints change the world. You know, like when we talked about I don't know what semester it was, a few semester ago, when we talked about having that sort of Catholic vision of history. Right, the Catholic vision of history is the story of saints stepping in and changing the world, and that's no different from any time. So yeah, sin makes us stupid. Holiness makes us not so stupid, and uh, and saints change the world. All right, so now we're we're gonna. Uh, examine my man crush on St. Thomas. Okay, uh, and by the way, the church has a, has a crush on them too, so that's why. I think. <laughs> um, all right, so we already talked a little bit about just the idea that, uh, that St. Thomas, t- as a philosopher, tends to get ignored because he's got all this theological garbage around him. Okay? Um, like I said, I'd be really interested if any of you take a philosophy class and they teach St. Thomas, I, would be, I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, uh, sure. Really? Leadership and ethics. And how much like... Navy class. Um, uh, we had stoicism, we had uh, uh, natural, natural law. Oh, uh, yeah, we talked about the natural law. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so yeah, anything that dips into natural law, uh, which is a little... It's actually kind of odd, right? So, like, natural law, as like, the founders of our country saw it, came, they stole it from the clients. Uh, I asked about natural law, I asked about St. Thomas, and he said no, but... Yeah, I mean that's just the. It, it's because because it, it, he has somehow he has a like a theological label on him, um, so and it makes it seem like it's tainted, right? Um, so um, so anyway, so a lot of what we'll draw from is his summary of theology when we talk about philosophy when we talk about it this semester. Um, so uh, so his he never wrote like a just a. A philosophical book per se. I mean, he has commentaries, philosophical commentaries on works of Aristotle. Um, so you're not going to just get this book of St. Thomas's uh, philosophy that he wrote. So we've got to kind of pick it up in different places. But you'll find it's very, it's completely thorough, um, and he covers everything. All right, and so his body of thought and the breadth of it is what the church, why the church has always um, looked to him. Okay, so even. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this. So during the Council of Trent, um, when you know they would process in, when the cardinals would process in, uh, they carried the scriptures and they put them up on the altar, and beside the altar they put the Summa. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's how highly he's thought of. Right? And if you read the Council, anything from the Council of Trent, you basically just, I mean, it looks like a footnote to the Summa, um, and, and for good reason. Okay. And so one of the things we've sort of seen um, over the last. Uh, probably 150 years as the world has moved away from uh, St. Thomas, the church has too. Right? Where um, it's not taught as much in the seminaries um, as it was. 
Uh, and Pope Leo XIII saw this kind of coming. Um, so when he was writing, I think it's in 1888, he wrote an encyclical on St. Thomas. Here's what he said, While therefore we hold that every word of wisdom, every useful thing by whomsoever discovered or planned, ought to be received with a willing and grateful mind. So he's saying, truth is truth, right? Take it where you find it, use it. Um, we exhort you, venerable brethren, in all earnestness to restore the golden wisdom of St. Thomas and to spread it far and wide for the defense for the defense and beauty of the Catholic faith, for the good of society, for the advantages of all the sciences. So that's our motivation, right? Like he just named why we're here, right? Um, for the defense and beauty of the Catholic faith, to understand and defend, for the good of society, so that we can go out with the truth um, and change the world, and for the advantage of all the sciences. Okay, so this will, I promise you, like when I went to graduate school, it changed my way to think. Like completely and totally, St. Thomas, the encounter with St. Thomas changes the way you think forever. Um, there's just a clarity to it, and it brings a uh, clarity to your own mind and your own thought that's pretty remarkable. Um, all right, so the wisdom of St. Thomas, we say, for if anything is taken up with too great subtlety by the scholastic doctors, um, the school of sort of, uh, this may, you guys are made of this, so just touch on reason. The scholastic, uh, the idea of scholastic, scholastic just means school, and that's just the, the school of philosophy that grew up around St. Thomas and his teachings. So you'll see that sort of used. You'll see Thomistic and you'll see scholastic. Uh, by the scholastic doctors are too carelessly stated, if there be anything that ill agrees with the discoveries of a later age or in a word improbable, in whatever way, it does not enter our mind to propose that for imitation to our age. Let carefully selected teachers endeavor to implant the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas in the minds of students. Right, so he's saying this is what teachers should do, and set forth clearly his solidity and excellence over others. Right, so uh, that to me is actually, it seems like the Pope, uh, as a spiritual father, is telling me I should have that man crush. Like that's how I read that. Um, <laughs> set forth clearly his solidity and excellence over others. All right, so why now? Like why is this really important? Okay, so again, returning back to him. Pretty much every pope since Leo the Thirteenth, um, Leo the Thirteenth was the last one to write a cyclical on uh, on Saint Thomas. Although John Paul II mentions him a lot in Faith and Reason, he days at Rossio, um, and again saying the same things like seminaries need to teach Saint Thomas. Um, but uh, if you sort of look around, you'll realize that his philosophy actually is really needed right now. Like that way of thinking is really important. Um, so look at again. This is the prophetic character of, of the Pope. Look what he says. He says, "For the teachings of Thomas on a true meaning of liberty, uh, what, which at this time is running into license, okay, um, on the divine origin of all authority, right? So uh, on laws and their force, on the paternal and just rule of princes, on obedience to the higher powers, on mutual charity one towards another." On uh, all of these and kindred subjects have very great and invincible force to overturn those principles of the new order. Right? So St. Thomas's philosophy is so counter to like modernism, is what we would sort of call it, um, that the only way to uh, overturn it is to learn how he thinks and then to apply it, which are all well known to be dangerous to the peaceful order of things and to public safety. Okay. Um, so... Um, so if you if you think about um, this is just sort of a motive. Think about uh, we went over several of them uh, last semester, like the great heresies of the church, uh, like the Arian heresy. How was that put down? Well, <laughs> yeah, not exactly though. Not exactly. I mean, it was it was more like the Arian heresy is actually one of those interesting ones where like two thirds of the bishops were actually Arians and the. The lay people were the ones that were faithful, and eventually they just got rid of their bishops. Um, does anyone know, like, like what did St. Athanasius do? He made a philosophical argument. Right? He, he talked about person and nature, which are philosophical terms. Right? So, And it, you could trace this for every heresy without, throughout the church. All right, so this is a, another reason that philosophy is important, is because um, you look and... Uh, you know, go, go back to what I said about uh, about Protestantism, right? What do Protestants believe about the sacraments? They're just symbols. Yeah. Why? Why do they believe that? Is it convenient? Is it convenient, or does it fit 
So who knows what nominalism is? We already talked a little bit about this. So nominalism is the belief that there are no there are no natures, right? Everything is just named, and we just categorize them together. Okay, so if there is no nature, there's no supernature. So right? no forms exist and only matter exists. Um, no, there there's only individual forms. So he, he doesn't go that far. So uh, think of like you know angels have all their own natures. Yes. Everything has its own nature. Like that would be nominalism. Everything like everyone in this room. We're just here because we're kind of alike somehow, but there's no such thing as human nature. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so if there's no such thing as human nature, then how does God sanctify me? Yeah, and not by grace, right? Because grace would have to somehow adhere in my. He would have to. He would have to give me his nature. And so, why do we need sacraments? See, yeah, it's a philosophical error, right? Because he's like, look at these two things. Like, you don't need, there's no reason to have sacraments. Because you can't be made holy. You are what you are. And God just comes along and covers the, covers the dung with snow. Right? That's a philosophical error. Right? And that's why it's really important to be, to, because, guess what? Guess who Luther did it like in a seminary? He didn't want to learn St. Thomas. And then by the end, he, he's actually vitriolic against St. Thomas. I think he burned the Summa at one point. Yeah. He, did, he didn't like it, so he didn't want to learn it. And guess what happened? He went off the reservation. Yes. And so again, knowing that at the heart of Protestantism is nominalism, that changes the way we talk to Protestants about the sacraments. Right? Because if they don't believe that there's such thing as sanctifying grace that actually adheres to me and, and, and elevates my nature then there's no point in arguing about sacraments, right? Because you have to go back to the, to the problem. Yes? Go ahead, Casey. So you would, so I, I feel like a common thing that a Protestant might say is also like a distrust of authority. So you're saying that might be a, like how, how would you work? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there, it's, it's not just, so his theology has a philosophical area. Maybe his decision-making, I mean, it's, it, it is not just, so... But even their rejection of authority, in some ways, there's no way that God could speak through the successor of right? Because there's no such thing as sanctifying grace. There's no such thing as actual grace to, you know, that actually changes what someone does. Yes, Kai? So using this, and I'm like, I completely agree that any like, theological error is going to like result from some sort of philosophical error. And people have, without, without knowing it, Embedded kind of principles and assumptions. But like, like, I would say most most Protestants were not, you know, sat down in Sunday school and said, "Okay, nominalism." Yeah. And most Catholics were not say nominalism is wrong, therefore sanctifying grace. And but even with kind of you know, we talk about faith, like while I completely agree and think that that's kind of when faith starts to can start to, to become more real is when you start to have like the reason, um, and it's not just. Like relying on yeah, when you begin to understand, right? Like that. Uh, but most people, when they have their kind of conversion, it comes out of some sort of at least on a level of kind of what they feel. They're like, oh, it, it just felt kind of right. I, I think you could argue there's mm-hmm. some sort of like knowledge that's infused at that point, so they, it feels right because it is right. Yeah, and they know it at that point. I guess how do you go into conversations like you can't walk and say, yeah, I know you don't want to go to them and go like, yeah, you filthy nominalist. Like, <laughs> let me tell you how it is. <laughs> like, no, the idea is like you want to. You want to understand their way of understanding and then get them back to where the area is. So you're right. No one is, I mean, unless someone's a philosopher, they're not going to know what nominalism is at all, right? Um, but you have to understand that, like, until you get them where they can understand the idea that God infuses a share in his nature in us and then we can operate it, like a lot of the other arguments about sacrament don't work. That's the point, right? So you have to get them to understand that and figure out what the obstacle is. But... You know, it goes back to what I said at the beginning, right? So everyone has a philosophy. They just don't, they may not be able to name what it is, right? So, um, so yeah, so I'm not advocating going around like calling people nominalists um, or even telling someone, you know, like, hey, that's nominalism. Or, but it's more for your own sort of understanding of their thought pattern. Can you repeat what nominalism is? Yeah, so nominalism is basically the belief that there are no such things as natures. Nothing has a nature. So nature is the things what is what it is. So all of us have a human nature, right? 
Anomalous would say, no, we don't. We're just all individuals. Anomalous would just say that a human is just a label. We attach to things that yeah. we think are similar, but it's just a label, and it doesn't actually exist. It's just something that we refer to to make it easier to categorize them. Yeah, the Latin name for the Latin word for name is nomen, so that's where it's just everything we just name things because it's convenient to talk about. So where is this like you can't change idea coming from? Then? Well, because if you have no nature, then like well, we'll talk more about this later. But there's no uh, there's no bound on what you can and cannot be. So in other words, you're not defined. So how do you change? How do you even define change if there's no bound on what you you are and what you can be? Right. So change is always a measure from what you are to what you can be. And if there's no nature, then there's no bound on what you can be. Don't, don't if, if it doesn't say I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on anomalies. Don't get hung up on it. But it's just uh, know that it's around. Um, all right. So uh, John called left and he brought this up. So. Sometimes you'll come across objections about St. Thomas, about using the Summa, and say, well, he didn't even like it. Okay, so there's a story, um, which is probably true, and if it's not, it ought to be, um, that when he, uh, shortly before his death, he was in uh, praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and he had a secretary that always uh, worked with him. His name was Brother Reginald, and he went to check on him because he was, couldn't figure out where he was, and he heard him talking. And... Um, he uh, he's in there and he's praying and he's talking directly to Jesus and so Brother Reginald hears Jesus' voice and he says, Thomas, you've written well of me, what can I give you? And he says, only you, Lord. And so, um, yeah, so Casey has it on the back of his uh, laptop there. So, um, so after this encounter, whatever it was, uh, this incredible mystical experience, Brother Reginald cannot get St. Thomas to write anymore. And he's like, we've got to, we've got to finish what you're working on. And he's like, no. Now, and finally, he has one of his superiors come to St. Thomas and, and, under obedience, make him answer why he won't write anymore. And he says, well, because all that I've written is straw compared to what I've seen. Okay. So what does he mean by that? Okay. I mean, it, it's not that he's poo-pooing what he wrote. But this is important to summarize what we've talked about, about uh, philosophy and theology. It's like you said that us calling him all powerful and us calling him all present, like even those like are are inferior. Like even those are, are poorly poor descriptions of him because he is so much like more than that. Yeah, so that is certainly part so our ideas about God are not God. The ideas he gives us of himself are not God. Right? Their knowledge of him and it's genuine true knowledge of him but nothing compared to what you will see when you see him face to face. All right, so St. Thomas has this encounter, and what he realizes from this encounter, I'm not saying he saw God face to face, was that once you have that real encounter, words are no more help, aren't helpful any longer. All right, so he's like this man walking around at night, right? And he knows there's a sun because he can see it reflected off the moon. All right, and he uses that, and he uses it for his light, Okay. Then day finally comes, and he doesn't need the moon anymore. All right? And so the idea then is to understand that we're dealing with mysteries, right? Like, and mysteries mean things that God has revealed, but it's not something we will ever fully comprehend, not even in the beatific vision. Okay? So these are, these are ideas, and they're really important because they guide us, but they're not the real thing. Right? And we can get caught up in that sometimes. Um, and that was St. Thomas saying, yeah, I've written well. If you've written all these things, and they're true. And he didn't say this is, he said you've written well. He didn't say this is a bunch of junk and throw it away. And he just said, he's like, once I've experienced that, I don't even have words now to describe. Like, I can't talk about God anymore. Right? Um, and you see this when you, when, and a lot of the saints, when they get to the higher levels of prayer, they just can't talk about it. Because words don't, ideas don't fit anymore. They've had these real encounters with God. Um, all right, so um, let me. Uh, I might just stop here. So let me just sort of explain that. Okay, so. Uh, all right, so uh, to use this as sort of a summary then. So obviously, then, philosophy is important for theology. Okay. 
Um, obviously, we need it uh, in order to reason about theology. Okay, so so we have these revealed truths, um, and we need it to, to show the reasonableness of it. Okay, and so that is our motivation um, for doing this this semester. Okay, don't don't let don't let that sort of fall out of our mind as we sort of stick with mostly philosophy, um, and we'll get into a few things theological, but don't forget that the end game is then so that we can better understand what God, God is saying when he uses human categories, okay? So when he speaks of wisdom, we know what wisdom is. When he uses, uh, when there's places in scripture where, you know, where St. Paul reasons to things, right? Where he reasons to, you know, there's that famous passage in um, 1 Corinthians where he says, well, if there's no resurrection, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, like, that's a that is a deductive argument he's making. It's a perfect example of it, right? Um, so that these human categories we begin to, we can understand better, and then that we can also uh, we can also defend it better. Um, yeah. So, um, so that's all I got. Questions? So you will find uh, some of you that are near here. We will get off on tangents a lot, like we did today, um, which is I'm totally fine with. Um, because I want to make sure that things are sinking in and the questions are getting answered. Um, but if questions do come up that I don't answer, let me know and we'll talk about them. Um, you can either email me or text me or whatever. Yes, Casey? This isn't a question as much as a statement. Um, I just point out that like this might be going over your head or this might be difficult to con- uh, understand, but the value of this is not that from one necessarily you know event it's altering, but the fact that the more you do this, the more you're able to think in this pattern and, and, and Yeah, like one expo that's a great point. So one exposure to this is not gonna change your pattern of thinking. Um, so what Casey's saying is you have to come back. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, and I agree. I, I wholeheartedly agree. So, you know, just to kind of post a little bit about my background. So I went to state, I graduated in statistics, went to graduate school, statistics, um, started taking my faith pretty seriously. Decided I wanted to get a master's degree in theology. So I'm totally an egghead like you guys, um, or like most of you. Um, but the point is, is that uh, no matter what you're doing, like faith is really important. And understanding it is really, it's not just for theologians. Everybody should be a theologian. Um, so that part is really, like as you get older, uh, like to have that base and that foundation is really important, right? Um, you know, I'm going to use you as a, an example, right? So he runs across these questions of, like, moral questions, and he sends them to me, right? That's the idea. So he can, he's learning how to think about things. Like, I had a discussion about this. Was this right? Like, that's the kind of stuff you guys have been talking about with each other. You can bounce it off of me. Like, that's the idea, to get us to be able to keep thinking like that, right? It's really important. Um, and then just to really understand that this is, uh, you know, this is the really important stuff in life. Like, if you build this foundation now, like, it'll change the way you live and, and think and act for the rest of your life. All right, questions? Yes, Keegan. Um, and then Sherman. Going back to the nominalism a little bit, what is, like, to kind of help me understand it, all, like, the correct thinking opposed to nominalism? Can you just quickly go through that? Yeah, so nominalism is a form, remember we talked about idealism? It's sort of a form of that. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's just the categories are all in my like categories don't exist in reality they exist in my head so we just grin that in to talk about them we group them together so uh, it's so that is the the antidote to it is, is realism right like because at the heart of it first of all is the fact that it has a there's an error in even in the thinking like well why do we group those together like if there's nothing that actually groups things together why do you still group them together like we don't and why, do you, why did you group everyone in this room together and not, why didn't I get grouped with that chair? Like, other than the fact that I'm as dull as that chair, like, what, what else is there, like, to group us together, right? Like, so, um, we, we talked about, like, nominalism has no root in experience. Um, and so, a lot of times when you're talking to people, like, that actually, because you'll talk to people that are more philosophical, you just ask, is that, is that really how you experience life, though? And you'll find that, uh, that there's often a disconnect between ideas and reality in, in their mind. Um, and they just have to sort of hopefully root them back to reality. So in regard to, you were talking about like, salvation would make sense from a nominal 
political standpoint, is that from the idea that like why the incarnation happened and like why we were saved as mankind, or I, that was kind of the yeah. So, so some of that is okay. So, like as Catholics, we believe that uh, salvation is a um, corporate event, like we're saved together. Um, where and that's why Protestants believe salvation is an individual event because there's nothing like what what binds us together. Um, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Just... Yeah. I mean, you begin to like when you really start to unpack like the thinking pattern, and again, not the average walking around Protestant, but that's what Luther was doing. Like Luther thought it out, right, and and carried it to its conclusions. 